I want to title this today, Worldly Versus Spiritually. Worldly Versus Spiritually. I can say it like that if I'm bad, tongue twisting. Um, how are you identified? You know, the, the Bible talks about, and I mentioned this earlier, that uh, Paul, I believe, is the one that penned this in one of his prison epistles, that we are a, um, a written epistle known and read of all men. And so when we go out, it's easy to be in here. It's easy to be a Christian. We can read each other on the outside and say, wow, we're doing pretty good. We look pretty sharp. It's a pretty good think day going for us. We're excited about this. And, you know, we, we fellowship among the brethren, and, uh, and we do all the things that we're, God has asked us to do. And we look good in church. It's easy to look good in church. It's easy to sing the right songs. It's easy to say the right things. It's easy to say amen. We love one another. It's easy to do all those things because we're in church. It's a familiar setting. It's a safety net for us, if you will. We can come in here. We can get rest. We can get fed from the Word of God. We can sing songs that help to feed us too. And we just get, I really like the fellowship part. Um, to me, that's just the best part of having church is fellowship uh, outside the preaching of the Word of God. But when we get together and we can shake hands and hug and, and just chat and catch up on, hey, how you doing? Heard you had you were sick. Heard you had surgery. Hey, I just heard you got to raise it. You know, God's been good to us through all these things, and fellowship really helped bring that up out of us. And so we can identify really easy in a church as being uh, not only spiritual, but scriptural too. It's easy to do those things. But when we walk out of here, it, it, it's a little bit more difficult because now we got other people who we don't know that are looking us through the windows, if you will. You know, uh, we had some neighbors when we were growing up. They watched us all the time through the windows of the house. You know, we never hardly saw them, but they were watching us. You could see the curtains move. I don't know if they knew we could see curtains move, but you could see the curtains move. And some of you have found that out, you know, by door knocking and going up the house. You, you, you don't hear them, but you see the curtain move, and they're peeking through, you know, and all of that. And I always want to say, I know you're in there. Just open the door, you know. Anyway. Um, or I have candy. We don't want to do that, do we? I don't know. But anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah. So there are some marks, aren't there, that help identify us? You know, uh, physically, we have some marks. You know, you have a baby, and you're looking at the baby. Oh, what a cute little bug, you know? And you're looking, and, and the baby starts to grow, and oh, you got grandma's nose, and you have great Uncle Henry's eyes, and and you have this, and oh, look at those. Look at those little bitty hands, and they remind me. And we have identifying marks. As a child gets older, they start developing more into some more identif mark, identif identifying marks of the family. And we can identify them. And we see more and more of maybe the heritage of the family as someone. And we may skip a generation. The next generation may come up more likeness of those ahead of us. Um, and so we have those physical marks uh, to do that with. We uh, understand, you know, um, um, I don't know. I you lose your hair because dad lost his hair and grandpa lost his hair and, and great grandpa lost his hair. So you might have uh, more hair loss that way. And you go, Oh, why did y'all have to do this to me? I'm losing my hair, you know, and, and that, or you may, you may have a certain way, uh, you know, your eyes are wider and shorter and different things. And we just have, uh, can I call them physical marks that identify uh, us. You wear a baseball uniform. And you've got cleats on. I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I, I, I would say you play ball. We identify, right? We look at that. you got a football uniform on. You wear a helmet. I would say you play football, you know? Um, that or you're um, going into the kitchen to tell your wife how to cook something. One of the two. You're just protecting yourself. Um, and so you have all those things that help identify you. Uh, we just look. Uh, oh, you're nearsighted, farsighted? You can't, yeah, yeah, it's one of those. I don't really, I just know I can't see without them, so that works. Um, and so we have those, but we have uh, ways to identify one another. But you know, the Bible also says that we have a way to identify us if we belong to the world or we belong to Jesus. 
There, there, there's identification marks that are found in the Bible. I think that would apply to each one of us that as we are out here on the street, that we are at our job or in our school or we're at the neighbor's house, there ought to be something that would identify you as a child of God. And we ought to portray that, and we ought to not be ashamed of that. We ought to let that even stand out even more that, hey, um, by the way, I'm, and they'll say, oh, yeah, we know you're a believer. Wouldn't that be great if they could finish that before we could? If they noticed that in us first, and they said, oh, you, you, do you go to church? You kind of look like you would go to church. Uh, wouldn't that be a great thing if someone just walk up and says, oh, and I've had that happen before. Um, the, right after I had my head shaved, I had to go to Walmart for something, and I went through there, and the lady at the register says, do I know you? I'm like, no, I don't think so. I've never been in this Walmart. And she said, hmm, are you a Christian? Uh, well, yeah, uh, I am. Yeah. Said, okay, I'm a preacher. <sighs> I knew you were a believer when I first saw you. That just makes happy. I'm like, hey, well, amen. And it's good to be recognized. It's good to be known. I don't want to just uh, put it on a big shirt that says, hey, look at me. I'm a Christian. You know, I want it to be, you know, open the door for somebody, be nice to somebody, uh, always have a kind word. Say amen all the time. It, it doesn't hurt to say amen. I say it at work. Um, and I do work for Walmart now, coincidence, I suppose. But um, God had a plan for me to be there. And, and I get these people coming through the store and we'll say something. I'll go, well, amen. And I'll, oh, that's a church word. Yeah, it is. You like it? Kind of. Right? And I get some of those back at me. Well, we didn't know church people worked at Walmart. Well, we do. Most of them are hiding, though. I'm just telling you. Most of them are. We have a lot of hiding secret service believers in America. All right? And seriously, they don't want the neighbors to know they go to church. They they changed their clothes on the way to church. They went out normally. They get there. I know some people. I'm telling you because I know some people who do this. They just don't want anybody to know they go to church. Why? Because they fear persecution. Because they fear ridicule where they live. They just don't want their neighbors to understand that they're different. They try to fit in, but they want to still go to church. Oh, y'all. Y'all need some help. Okay. So, but there are some identifying marks. And so what I want to look at today is, is maybe the Bible would help us to see how we identify. Maybe there's something that, whoa, I need to really think about. So for the same person today, uh, here in Galatians, we're going to look at something about how we should walk. And, and um, that could not, I'm not going to get on this, this big uh, wagon of going down into details of everything on how one person should look and, and, and do this and all that. But that's going to be between you and God and, and how the Lord speaks to you on some certain things. And we'll leave it up to the preacher to take care of the rest. Uh, I'm leaving. He can fix my mess when I'm gone. Um, but hopefully we're on the same page with a lot of this. But I'm glad you're here today. I think God has a purpose and a message for every heart that has an ear to hear and from his word today. So if you're still in Galatians chapter 6, we're going to look at verse 16. In verse 16, we're going to run down to 17. And it says this, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And so the question here comes to this, and it says, uh, do you bear the marks of Jesus? Do you bear the mark? Well, what does that mean? Does that mean the actual physical where they nailed his hands to the cross and maybe his feet to the cross? And uh, maybe you have the, 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 the marks of Jesus where you have uh, a hole in your side or, or uh, where the thorns were on his crown, uh, the scars from his beard being pulled. Uh, no, we're not really talking about that. We're talking about the marks of Jesus. What was it that made Jesus stand out when he walked on this planet? What were some of the things that he did um, that would help identify if you were to do the same thing? Because we know by following the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, we understand that it was there they were first called Christians as mocking terms because they identified to act like Jesus. To act like Jesus. Wow. Well, how about this one? Love one another. Act like Jesus identify with Jesus. An identifying mark would be like, you know, the fellowship that we have in here. 
the brethren are getting along, we enjoy the company together. There's no better place to have a group gathering than when you have a group of believers together from the church, have a fellowship. Maybe you have a, uh, maybe you're watching a ball game and you just have a bunch of snacks, or maybe you're out in the backyard um, and playing yard darts with the original ones, okay, and and all of that. Um, but you're just having a good time in the backyard. You're just having a fellowship time, and that's a great place to be. That's one of the best places to be um, with one another that love Jesus. I'm just uh, trying to be a help to you today. So if you're saved today, there's some identifying marks that you ought to find. If you're not saved today, in other words, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord uh, shall be saved. But always remember Romans 5, 8, because God loved us way before we were. But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that awesome to know that way before I was, he knew he had to die for me so that one day, 40 years ago this November, I called on Jesus as my Savior. But it's exciting. It's exciting. I got heaven for a home. I have a place being prepared for me. How do I know that? John chapter, yeah, John chapter 14. Jesus says that he's left to go prepare a place for me. I talk to him almost every day about the place he's making for me. I know he's not done building it because I'm still here. When he finishes my house, he'll call me home. Isn't that awesome to know that he has finished? Um, good. So I've given him some plans. I don't know if you can do that or not, but I've tried. I don't know if you can put something into your home, but you can talk to Jesus, right? He wants you to communicate with him, have a walk with him, have a good fellowship with him. I want a, I want a pond, and I want fish in it. Nothing wrong with that, I don't think. Jesus, was a, he was a fisherman. He likes fish. He even told them what side of the boat to throw their net. He knows where all the fish is. He's the best fish guide there is. Now, when he said he wanted to make you fishers of men, he's the best fish guide there is. When you go to Jesus and you pray and he says, listen, you've been over there. I want you to cast your net over here. In other words, cross the street. And I want you to go over here. I have prepared some fish for you if you'll just not do it your way, but you go over here and do it my way. I think Jesus is the greatest fisher of men. Why don't we just take lessons from him on how to fish and use him as our guide? Don't be ashamed of having a guide for fishing. They're just going to take you to the hot spots. And Jesus will do that too. Identifying marks. If you're lost today, you have some identifying marks. You don't know everything. The Bible's going to be kind of foreign to you. You're not going to quite understand some of the things in there when he says certain things. You know how to live your life. Man, I've been living this life and nothing's been wrong. I have not killed anybody, preacher. I haven't even run over a cat in the street. Talk to me about that. We'll work on that one. And then, um, but otherwise, everything is good. I said that. I own four cats. I really can't say too much. But anyway. So you have identifying marks. So what is it that identifies you as a child of God today. You know, I'm saved. Yeah. Right. You have a testimony? Anybody? Everybody? Somebody had one testimony, right? Everybody has a testimony? Y'all get saved? You have a testimony. All you got to do is just tell people what Jesus did for you. That is the most easiest thing to do. But he, I have this young man, and I've always wanted to hear his testimony when I was a youth pastor. And he never would tell me his testimony. He would get mad at me because he'd get defensive. And he goes, why do you always want to know how I got saved? He goes, I told you I'm saved. Isn't that good enough? No. <laughs> I'd like to know your story. I'd like to know how it was that you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Who, who opened the Bible and showed it to you? I think that's one of the greatest things we can talk about today is those, those stories that we have that are behind us that help me to remember, yes, I got saved. It was a wonderful time. But when you get defensive and you don't want to share a testimony, I would personally, I, I would start to doubt that. Now, that's just between me and the flesh and maybe, but I would kind of think that why would you not want to share a testimony of what Jesus has done for you? So identifying marks um, are like that. So we identify some people. But I think, you know, um, I was a good guy. My mom would always tell people and, and she would always get compliments uh, my mom uh, divorced in 19, late 1970. My sister was born in June of 70. And, and then mom divorced later. And, and so we didn't, have a, we didn't have a father figure in the home and until 75. 
And then, um, and then, so I had a stepdad from then on. But people would always come up and say, you have a really nice son. Really nice son. I'm seven, eight, nine years old going through that stage. And um, he is so polite. He tipped his hat when I walked in front of him. And they held the doors open. And, and, and I heard this growing up. I heard how good I was. I was just good. I like that. I was, you know, I was an angel, right? And, um, but something happened, but we won't go into that part. But anyway, so all this time, I'm hearing that how good I am, and I got nothing to worry about. Until I found out that my goodness doesn't get me into heaven. Just because I tip my hat doesn't get me into heaven. Just because I say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, I open the doors, I'm the last to go, I will wait for everybody to go eat first, and then I'll take whatever's left. It's just the way I am. But none of that, none of that courteousness, no books on how to behave, none of those things will get you into heaven. If I'd have died, I'd have went to hell. If I'd have died... I would have told the Lord, Lord, everybody told me I was a good person. I don't understand. I don't, I, that's what I would have said. I, I don't understand. Everybody told me I was good. I don't, aren't you a God of love? So wouldn't you? I, and he said, no. You don't know my son, Jesus. And Jesus is the only way into heaven. And I'm sorry, but I can't accept your offerings of goodness because then I would have to back up and everybody else that tried to offer goodness, I would have to come and let back in and go against my own word. And God can't do that. He's a just God. He's a righteous God. He's a God of love. And that's the reason he loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son that he might have to go to the cross of Calvary. And he's got identifying marks. So let's see if we can identify just a few of them here in a little bit of time that we have. John chapter 11, verse 25, talks about having the life of God. The life of God. And so just real quickly here, let me read that to you. Uh, verse 11, 20, or chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, Yet shall he live. One of my favorite passages is Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present ye, that's the brethren, I beseech ye, talking to saved people, brethren, saved people, that ye, brethren, saved people, present your, back to the brethren again, saved people, bodies, that's what you have here in the flesh, a living sacrifice. He's not asking you to go out and get run over by a truck and die or whatever. A living sacrifice. While you are here right now, this is your now. This is your sacrifice right now. I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Wow. Holy. I mean, to live a righteous life. It means to do that which God has asked us to do to be an identifiable mark in the world that we live in today. Can the world identify you as not part of them? Well, we have to go through the world, but I am not of the world. If you're saved today, you, you, you did away with that of the world. And now you're of God. Right? Are we there on the same page? So I'm no longer of the world, right? This world is not my home, even though I've got a temporary address. And I'll have one on wheels before too long, but it's just temporary. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Oh, but while we're passing through it, God has a few things for you and I to do. Just a few. I'm not asking much. All he wants is you. We're not much. The Bible describes us as really pretty low. Worms. I mean, we can talk about that if you want to. I mean, we're pretty low. And then we get saved and 
while we have life. We're going to get into that in just a moment. I thought I had life. I grew up on a farm. I thought I had life. I learned how to raise hogs and pigs and how to work on some horses and did some cows. I was doing everything. I took animals to the fair and I'd bring home trophies. I'm going to look at this grand champion trophy. Ha! Me. No, it was the chicken. It wasn't you. All, right, all you did was take the chicken. Yeah, I know, but still. Me, my name was on the card. And so I got all these trophies. I got all this stuff. I, I was just building up what I thought was life. And then I met Jesus. And then I saw I really didn't have life. That really wasn't what life is all about. And Jesus said that if you'll accept me, I'm going to give you life, but I'm going to give you even more than that. I'm going to give you what I call abundant life. A life that is more fulfilling, has a more meaning, has more purpose than just wandering aimlessly through this planet that we call our temporary home. Isn't that something that Jesus says, I can give you more than what you have right now. So we have the life of God. And in that life, we have what's called, called the quality of life. Have you noticed the difference? I don't know when some of y'all got saved. Listen, if you got saved when you were young, you never had to deal with a lot of that stuff we had to deal with as kids and growing up as teenagers. You were sheltered from that. You have a mom and dad who took care of that from you. And so you didn't have to be subjected to many of the things that kids go through today. And sad for them, but man, I'm thankful for these kids that grew up in a Christian home and were able to be sheltered from a lot of this stuff the world is throwing at them. I'm telling you. I thought that would have been a pretty good amen point there. But anyway, we'll move on. But um, I didn't have that growing up. And when I got saved, I was the only one in my house. My brother wasn't saved. My sister wasn't saved. Nobody in my house was saved. And But my mom was glad I was going to church, but she didn't want anything to do with church. And so here I'm the only one in my house that has a Bible. And I'm the only one in my house that's sitting in the living room while everybody else is watching TV and I have a Bible. Well, don't you want to put that Bible away and watch TV with us? Uh, no, let me finish this chapter. I didn't know any different, but I didn't have anybody there to help me out. I'm just in my home all by myself. But you know what? Jesus said, I'll bless you for it. I'll bless you for it. And then my brother gets saved. And then a little bit later, my sister gets saved. And then we're all there, right? So, Dad, how about you? Well, church is for like really old people and kids. And so when you graduate, you're going to get a job and we won't do church anymore and you'll have to make a living because you'll find a girl one day and you'll have to be able to support her and you'll do all these things. And, and that's how my dad grew up. He worked up a hard working man on the railroad and in the caves up in Kansas City. And so all of this was just about work, 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 work. You never had any downtime, you know, and so there really was nothing there. And, and I'm like, so, okay. Did you ever get saved? He goes, when I was a kid, you had to be saved to join the choir. I didn't want to join the choir. So uh, after I got saved, I didn't want to join the choir, but they made me join the choir anyway. And then we just quit going to church. So, okay, so that's all I have to go on. I don't have anything else. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to do anything. So my dad died in 2008, but the only hope I have is based off what he said when he was a kid. So I'm hanging on to that hope. I'm not trying to doubt it or anything. I mean, I got, I got a little glimmer of hope that what he said was true. And I hope so. I hope that he, Roman 10, 13, that he called upon the name of the Lord to save him. I really do. And then you may have some loved ones like that too, but we had that. Jesus has given us life and, and he wants you to have life and the quality of life. Listen, the quality of life that Jesus offered is called eternal life. That's the quality of life you get. You want a life insurance? Get Jesus. The quality of life is eternal life. Forever, I'm going to be on the streets of gold and through the pearly gates and looking at all these wondrous things of Jesus. Forever, I'm going to be standing in front of Jesus in a quality of life that I could never imagine. The stories I think I hear today probably aren't even close to what heaven's like. Probably aren't even close. I mean, they're just a touch, what John talks about in Revelation. But in my imagination, I'm like, wow, it's a whole lot better than what I'm reading right here. Got to be. I'm looking forward to it. Quality of life. Quality of life. Oh, 
I take 16 pills in the morning so I can function during the day. I have an immune system that is beating me up. I just had my neck fused, and um, I have pre-existing nerve damage that cannot be shut down. So I have all these pills that I have to take uh, throughout the day. Um, I'll be so glad when I get to heaven there ain't a pill bottle there. You know? There won't be, I won't need these glasses either. That's going to be good. Uh, I can see you all. That's fine. It just uh, takes a little bit of the shadow and the blur away. But I won't need that. I'm getting a new hip next year. What is that? I'm getting a new body when I get to heaven. Woo! You all know <laughs> that artificial hip ain't going to make it up there. It ain't, there. There's nothing artificial in heaven. It's real. There's, I mean, if there was something artificial in heaven, it wouldn't be heaven. There's nothing artificial. Oh, I got a buddy of mine. He's in El Paso. He has a glass eye. He has a glass eye. He went to the Christian school in Olathe, and uh, the supervisor, Brother David Randall, had asked him, he said, Alan, he goes, I need you to keep an eye on this. I got to go to town. I'll be right back, and then we'll finish that. He's like, okay. Brother Randall left. He popped his eye out, set it on it. We all went to the gym. He kept his eye on it. Uh, this kid got in so much trouble in school. Listen, he did a lot of things. But um, uh, that, bar that marble eye is not making it to heaven. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? My fingers will straighten back up. My fingers, my, my, my AR systems, uh, symptoms will disappear. No more aches and body. I tell my mom that she fed me Rice Krispies when I was a kid on purpose because when I turn 55, all I do is snap, crackle, pop. Listen, I'm trying to help some people. Watch it. But we get that way, and we'll have none of that in heaven, and there's going to be, oh, I'm just waiting. Oh, uh, it's going to be a good time, quality of life. Not only is it a life in heaven, it's an everlasting life. That quality of life is forever. You know, we think a quality of life down here, it's temporary. You may have a good quality. Y'all go on vacation and you have a good quality time out. I like going to Minnesota. We got a lake up there, Lake Vermilion. I get a cabin. We got a cabin on an island one time. We had a good quality of life weekend. Then we had to come back to Kansas and go to work. All right? Not that you can't have a good quality life. I'm telling you, we, we had a little bit better when we were away from here. I mean, can you think of how much better when we're away from here and we're in heaven? Quality of life, everlasting. I get to look at Jesus' face and sing praises to him all the time. All the time. God's going to give me a voice to sing. That's going to be a great thing. I am looking forward to it. I don't know about y'all, but heaven ought to be on your list, of your bucket list of things to look forward to doing. It's exciting. I'm looking, I don't know about y'all, but heaven has got to be there. And then there's the quota of life. Listen, not just life, but abundant life. Not just life. Not just joy. Y'all know what joy is? Isn't it awesome? I know, Bible, we can, we can break joy up into Jesus, others, and you. I get all of that. But the Bible talks about a special joy. A special joy. Happiness is temporary. You know what I'm talking about? Somebody brings, we get a little puppy that comes into Walmart every now and then. A little cute little mongrel looking dog and they bring a thing in and to them it's their whole world. And I understand that. I had a puppy and now he's two years old and he thinks he's a lap dog and he's about 70 pounds. Um, but they bring this little bundle of joy in, and everybody goes, Oh, can I see the puppy? Can I see the puppy? I want to see the puppy. Let me see the puppy. What, can I hold the puppy? You know, and they're all like that. But as soon as that puppy leaves, everybody's back to, oh, it's all gone. That's just happiness. Joy. Joy hangs around. You see, because joy comes from deep inside that God gives. When you got saved, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Hey, we don't have to go very far. Just back up into Galatians in chapter 5, and you can read the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is a fruit. Of, you have it. You have it. The reason, uh, have you ever tried to mix the fruit of the Spirit? Like, for example, I want to put joy and long-suffering at the same time in my life. Whoa. Now, you're asking me to do something hard. You want me to be patient and have joy at the same time? 
Yeah, I want you to endure long suffering, patient, endure, and have joy all at the same time. And I want you to love one another. Go love your neighbor while you're enduring whatever you're going through and have joy. Find joy in whatever it is that you have to have long suffering through and then go tell your neighbor you love them. That'll change you. What do I mean by that? You're letting the Holy Spirit do its job. You're getting rid of those things that you thought self could have and self could handle in your life. And I'm telling you, abundant life, there's no self. It's all about Jesus. And when we can get our lives to be identified that, hey, it's all about Jesus, people will soon be identifying us. Hey, why are you happy? You shouldn't be happy right now. Well, Jesus, it's like I told him this morning. Jesus, that's what it is. You don't have to explain circumstances and everything. All you got to do is just tell them Jesus. That's either going to continue the conversation or they're just going to go, oh, and turn around and leave. <laughs> Most of the time, people just don't want to talk about Jesus. They're looking for something in the world to excuse it or explain it. But when you tell them Jesus is responsible, to them it's not that easy. It has to be more difficult than that. There has to be a better way to live that life. You can't have an abundant, joyful life without Jesus. But boy, doesn't he make the difference when you recognize him? Doesn't he make the difference in your family? You're trying to raise your kids and you're trying to have a good relationship with your spouse and you put Jesus in there? It makes a difference, doesn't it? But when you take Jesus out, you notice that you begin to have a little bit more high intense fellowship. See, we, that's what I talk about, how Lois and I, we don't, we don't argue or fight. We just have intense fellowship. Because I like fellowship, right? And so if you have intent, anyway, we'll move. Someone's going to, anyway. Listen, not just joy, but the Bible talks about a joy unspeakable. You know, the joy I just can't explain. And all I can tell you, Jesus. He's the best explanation I have for unspeakable joy. There's just something about joy that just comes out and just changes everything. Um, two places I've worked in the last five years, six years, has been um, both in retail. And both jobs have said, huh, I'm the big bird of the store. The, the bright yellow big bird, you know, with everybody glooming around me. Can't help it. It's Jesus. When it's raining, it's Jesus. When you can't get out of your driveway because of the snow and ice, it's Jesus. When you have a flat tire and you were supposed to be somewhere and you get it fixed and two blocks down the road, the other one goes, it's Jesus. Joy unspeakable. Through all tribulations, read the book of James, through all tribulations and trials, it's Jesus. And when you and I, as a child of God, can get a hold of the very fact that it's Jesus, it'll change our lives. It'll change your neighbor's life. It'll change the people you work with. It'll make a difference in your family. And when it makes a difference in your family, it'll make a difference in your church. But not just joy, but joy unspeakable. Not just peace, but a peace that passeth all understanding. Oh, I can't explain it. Sorry, I just know it. Well, how can you have peace over that? They just told you they had four weeks left to live. Oh, I know my Jesus. Yeah, I'm not, it doesn't mean I'm not going to grieve, and it doesn't mean I'm not going to have any sorrow. It just means that I know that Jesus is going to get me through it. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to have a hurdle or I'm not going to have a speed bump in life or a flat tire in life, if I can say it like that. It just means that I have peace that Jesus is going to take me through it. It doesn't mean that I, I'm going to face a storm and I watch somebody else go through that storm and now I get it. And I'm going to go, why me? But instead of saying, why me? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to show you through this storm. That's the difference. That's an identifying mark between someone who's living in the world and someone who's living in the book, living in Jesus. We identify ourselves by how we handle those things. It gives us a peace that we have. And listen, the joy unspeakable and a peace that passeth all understanding allows my cup to be full. And not just full, but runneth over. 
I've told people many times, if I see somebody getting really, really, really blessed, man, if, if I see this family right here and I see that God is just pouring out the blessing, then their cup running over, I want to be the saucer. No one looks at the saucer, you know. When you go buy when you go buy stuff and you look at cups and you you look at the cup, does that saucer go with it? Okay, you know, that's okay. It's just a, a tool to use for the cup. It catches what runneth over. That's what it's there for to catch the drippings. Like the woman at the table, all I want the breadcrumbs. All I want is what's running out of your cup to keep the rest. Just give me that little bit. I want to get close to somebody that God got their hand on and their cup is just running over. And I can get a taste of that. And I can get part of that. And then pretty soon my cup, my saucer is going to run over and someone else is going to run up and say, hey, I want to get a part of that. So when we have that, when we have that idea of identifying ourselves with Jesus, we're going to have that joy unspeakable and that peace that, that passeth all understanding. And our cup is running over and don't be that, don't be that sour one, okay? Listen, don't go to God and say, Lord, too much. <laughs> I don't know anybody that's ever told God outside in the Bible when they were gathering the stuff to build the temple that they had to like, okay, people, stop bringing stuff. We have way too much offerings. I don't know any Baptist preacher told you people to stop. Well, maybe Brother Rocky has, I don't know. But anyway, quit, you know, and that's it. But but don't tell God to slow the blessings down. No, let him, let him just come. And just let him keep pouring. And live the life that Jesus says is the best for you, that abundant life, and fill it up. And then in 1 John 1, 5, he talks about having light. Identifying your light will shine. Jesus is going to shine through you. Um, and the light of God gives this. It gives discernment. I'm able to see more about what's wrong and what's right. I can discern easier as a, as a person in, in deciding my walk with God. I can see the, excuse me, the path that God has. And I'm able to stay more on the path because he's given light. And I can stay there. And then we see a direction. I want to know where God's going, right? Don't we all? Lord, if you could just show me in a week in advance what this decision today right here is going to do. No? Okay. Well, how do I make the decision if I don't know what to do? And God says, trust me. He says, trust me. Walk by faith. Your cup's already running over. Don't let this little one thing deter from that. Don't let it stop the blessings. Just trust me by faith. Just go. Mm. Wow. You ever go, you ever take a step for God and you go, wow, that felt good. You ever do something and, and you know that God was honored with and his name was glorified and you're like, wow, that felt good. Not for me, but that he got honored. But that he used me. I became a vessel for him because I was identifying marks of Jesus in my life instead of the world. I was identifying with God. I was identifying that I was having peace with God and that my joy, despite my circumstances, despite my pains, despite all the medicine I have to take, despite my infusions, despite the interruptions in my life where sometimes I can't move, despite all of that, God, thank you for keeping me here and using me. Let me be a lighthouse. You see, he's my light. When does he stop becoming your light? Well, when you don't want him anymore. When you want to do it by yourself. When the world throws something a little bit attractive at you. You ever um, you ever call someone a squirrel? You know, like they're, they kind of lose attention, they lose focus, and they're supposed to, and they go, oh, squirrel. You know, we get that terminology because you're driving down the road, there's a squirrel in front of you, and you go to the left, he goes to the right, which means he went the same way you did. And he doesn't know which way to go. You don't know which way to go. But if you stop, he stops. He doesn't go anywhere if you stop. Try it. And then you move forward. He's trying to decide, okay, I'm going to play this game with you. And you're like, get out of the way. I don't want to run you over. You know? And, and we had that in life. 
and I believe Satan's tactic is to use those squirrel moments where we get so focused on doing something for God that sometimes he gives us something that catches us right over here, and all we have to do is just turn and look. Turn and look. Now, here's the thing. Here's what's going to help us. I mean, they're going to be able to, if I'm in the light, right, I'm, I'm going to discern whether that's of God or not. Is that of God? Maybe I need to ask my pastor. Maybe that decision takes prayer. Maybe that decision takes some counsel between two and three people. Maybe, I, I don't know. Oh, you know what? I can handle that. I'm an adult. I've been walking with God for a couple months now. I've got it under control. God, I'll be right back. The light shuts off. I go over into the darkness of the world. I test it out for a little bit. And because I'm in the darkness, sometimes I can't find my way back. Sometimes I can't find my way back. And then one day, I wonder who that is. Oh, hey, preacher. It's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah, just checking up on you. How's your light? How's your Bible reading? How's your prayer? You haven't been to church in a couple of weeks. Want to check up on you. You doing okay? Yeah, I just kind of followed this route over here. You know, work offered me this, and I got that. And then I had a buddy over here, and, man, it was a lifetime trip. I couldn't pass it up. I had to go on that trip, and it kind of took me away. And, you know, I'm just getting back, and I just, I, you know, I'll, I'll come back soon. You lost the light. You lost the joy and the peace. Your cup's not running over anymore. You're identifying now, instead of with Jesus, you've identified with the world. You've got those marks on you now. And the preacher's at your door going to help you. It's okay, preacher. I got it. I can make these decisions. I'm fine. No, you're not fine. No, you don't got it. The devil's got you, and you he has deceived you, and you are mm, drowning in your own self-decisions. But light helps us to have discernment, directions, and discipline. I'll give you this last point here. They have a love and longing for God. When you want a life with Jesus, you're going to long to be with Him and His people. I can't wait for church. I can't. I'll see a couple of you through the week, but man, I get to see all of you at church. I can't wait for church. I can't wait to see what the preacher's been laboring on. I can't wait to see how God has used him in the week and the message he's bringing on. I can't wait to hear the songs that the song leader prayed over the week and has made sure that God is pleased with the decision and it fits in line with the pastor. I can't wait to fellowship with one another. I can't wait. We have a longing and a desire and a love to be with Jesus and his people. I can't wait for church. Do y'all look forward to church? Man, it's exciting. It's a great time. And the next time you meet in a couple of days, it's going to be a wonderful time. And then after that, you'll have a couple more days, and you're back together again. And that's just a regular week. It's awesome. During the week, I want to make sure that I talk to somebody and fellowship with someone. Maybe I meet with them. Maybe I talk with them on the phone. Maybe I text them. Helps me out. I'm talking to God's people. A longing to always be with God and his people. Do you desire such a thing in your life? Do you desire, is that a desire that you have, that you look forward to that day? My, maybe it's just you, or maybe it's you and your family, or maybe it's just you and your spouse. Do you personally have your own personal desire to walk with God? I hope you do. I hope that you personally have something as an individual because it is an individual relationship. You see, because the closer that I get with God, the closer I can get with y'all. Isn't that awesome? Oh, I can get up close to you, but it won't be the real thing if God's not involved in it. I want the real thing. I like the real thing. And Jesus is all of that for me. He gives me all of that. And that identifies me, right? You ever recognize someone and go, oh, you're hurting today. You're hurting today. Oh, you're trying to hide it, but you're hurting today. I try to hide my pain all the time. I got someone that always comes up to me and says, Preacher, I know you what you're doing. You can't fool me. Oh, thought 
But it's one of those things that you can tell and say, I just want to pray for you. I don't have to know everything. I just know there's something I want to pray for you. You see, that's a longing and a desire to be with God and to serve God and to be with his people. Here, listen, when you love God, you'll love the scriptures. You love God? You can't love God without loving the Bible. I mean, you got to love his word. He gave it to you. It's right here. It's right in the middle of everything that we do. And I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. I want to read it again. I want to keep reading it. I want to stay with it. Stick, as some people have said, just stick with the book. You can't go wrong. This is your manual for everything you do. If you're having trouble in your relationship, stick with the book. If you're having trouble in church, go to the book. If you're having trouble uh, deciding on what color to paint the wall, go to the book. And whatever the first color that pops up in your reading, paint the wall. Uh Uh-oh. That may not work out so well. Anyway, but just stick with the book. If you love God, you're going to love the scriptures. If you love God, listen, you're going to love the saints. You're going to love one another. That's what Jesus said to do. When you come into church, you ought not have any bitterness with someone across the room. You ought to have peace. You ought to have something that's special. You ought to have a relationship and a fellowship because it's going to hurt the church overall if you have offense against one another instead of loving one another. What we need is revival of forgiveness today in this world. This whole world out here is on bitterness and unforgiving right now. And what we need is, yeah, you want a revival. Well, let's start with the revival of forgiveness and learn how to forgive again. And learn how to not take the blame and say, hey, you know what? It's not your fault after all. Here, I'm just going to ask you to forgive me. I'm just going to ask you to forgive me. And it, well, they did, no, it doesn't matter. You're doing it by the book. Go ask them. But, but, but they, nope, I don't care what they did. You go ask them for forgiveness and then you give them to God and then turn it over and you walk on. Go live. The reason you're having struggles is because you're not loving one another like we should. The reason that we struggle in our churches and sometimes our churches don't grow is because we don't love one another like we should. We don't have those identifying marks anymore. They're getting marred by the things that, well, the world, I don't care. I know what the world says. A lot of them doesn't. uh. You know what? I know it's old, but what used to be wrong not just many years ago, but just a few years, is now okay. We don't call them sins anymore. It's because we've gotten out of the book and we've gotten used to what the world is calling right and wrong. And I'm going to tell you, if we get back to the book, we'll find out what's wrong out there. We already think we know what's wrong, but when we line it up with this, we'll find out what's really wrong. And that's the thing we got to get back to. Do you love one another? Identifying yourself as a Christian as Christ would identify himself. That's the plan today. That's what walk, walk. I don't think a lot of us are walking like maybe we should. If I didn't lose my place, I'm going to read you one more verse. Listen, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. The closer you walk with God, you don't have to worry about that lust of the flesh. You don't. The closer I walk with God, I'm just going to push it off. I'm going to shun it. It's going to go away from me. I'm going to have a walk that is joy unspeakable and a peace that passes all understanding. And it's going to confuse some people and may even confuse some people in church. That's what it does. You ever wonder why the scriptures do things like that? It's because we have a walk with Jesus. Listen, so lastly, you have a love for the scriptures. I want to have a love and a longing for God. And I have a love for the saints. But I need to have a love for the sinner. Got to have a love for the sinner. I mean, Jesus himself said, I came not into the world to save the righteous, but to save the lost. And it's, you'll figure it out. I messed it up. And God wills that none perish. Is there room for everyone in heaven? If they'll ask Jesus to save them. Not everybody's going to get there. Because they're building up works. 
They're building up their own thing. They're even building up works in church. And that's that. I've seen a piano player for 20 years, and she gets saved. For 20 years, she thought she was saved. For 20 years, she was living someone else's dream of being a hope of heaven. My wife got saved in 2002. We've been married 12 years. Well, aren't you supposed to get married to someone that's saved? Yeah, she said she was. Gave a testimony. But then found out that she was living someone else's testimony. Well, we remember you doing this. Well, I don't remember any of that. Well, we do. I can't go by that. I can't go by what someone else remembers. I need it. And one day I walked down the hallway to the room and she was on the bed crying. I said, what's up? She goes, I'm lost. Really? Now it finally came. It finally came. After church on the way home, I'd ask her, so give me your testimony again. <sighs> you do this to me every week. I know, but there's something missing. I'm trying to figure it out. Tell me again. Oh, I just can't put my finger on it. Something was wrong with her testimony. It was bugging me. I just couldn't put my finger on it. And finally, through the message, it wasn't up to me to put my finger on it. It was up to God to show her. See, I was doing it all wrong. I wasn't asking God to help me do it. I was just wanting to do it myself. So I walked down the room, and it finally hit. She was lost. She says, I need to get saved. I said, all right. So I took the Bible, and she goes, I already know what to do. Just, just be here with me. She called on Jesus to save her. And we cried. We hugged. I called my pastor. Tears on the phone. Said, Lois got saved. We're going to heaven together one day. Oh, oh. do you love the sinner? It's a joyful time when they call on Jesus to save them. We've got to love one another, folks. That's the identifying marks of us. There's too much out there that's telling us that we are too picky, we're too hateful, we're too, that the, the Christian don't care for anybody but themselves. No, no. I'm trying to work on that. But I need some help. I need some other Christians that are going to help me love one another. So if you can't help me in any other way as I go on this evangelistic trail and I cross the street for everybody around and I go knock on these doors and I help people and I preach in churches, would you just help me if one thing only, just love one another. And the more we can love one another, the more we can lift up the name of Christ and be identified with him in anything that we say or do here on this earth. Simply, really, knowing him as Savior and learning to love one another, you'll grow close to Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for today and your love for us. What a blessing it is to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for these people. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to preach and to encourage them and to maybe help us a little bit in our walk with you, to help us a little bit of understanding how to draw close in order to understand that we do have this peace that is uh, surpassing all understanding. We don't understand it a lot of times, but that's okay. We thank you for it. And then this joy, mm, this joy, this unspeakable joy. Thank you for it. God, I just ask now for your help. If there is somebody here today, Lord, that we just don't know about our eternal security, we just don't know about heaven is where we'll end up. Lord, would today be the greatest day in that life that we'd accept Jesus as Savior today? And Lord, then the Christian that's here, the believer, the one that's trusted in Jesus as their Savior. Father, maybe there's something in our walk that needs a little help. Lord, we just pray you show it to us and be with us as we go through that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.